going to make a case for why Christians ought to vote in 2024, this, this coming election. As you can imagine, I get messages from people who push back on Christians being involved in politics with a gamut of reasons, including Jesus wasn't involved in politics, so you shouldn't be either. I'm going to try and address some of the common objections from Christians about our involvement in politics, even going as far as the act of voting itself. I hope you, you will see why I think American Christians have a responsibility and a moral obligation to cast a vote and even have these conversations with other Christians. At the end, if you still shut the podcast off and you disagree with the things that I, I say today, that's totally fine. I don't think that we should have conversations only if we agree. I think we should have them to get to the best possible answer when it comes to Christians and how we engage the culture. What I don't like, what I don't want to see is when people call others names for their views or, you know, come with statements that are not backed up with reasons. You just give a claim and you don't back it up with anything. If you want to join the conversation, great. Just be prepared to back up your reasons with evidence and biblical support, especially as a Christian. Before we get into the episode today, this is the last call for the Train Your Brain course for both middle school and high school adults, high school and adults. If you want to learn how to make a compelling argument and catch bad thinking by learning to identify informal fallacies, go to onlinechristiancourses.com and register right now. You won't be disappointed you will love this class. It's going to help you think better. And some of the things that we're talking about today in this episode, we are talking about, we, we learn and train your brain. So go to onlinechristiancourses.com to register. It is my favorite class, and I think you guys will enjoy it. Today, we are going to look at the following. First, what are the common objections that Christians give when it comes to just voting? Like, and politics and having these conversations. How do we respond to these objections with the word of God as our source, but also with reason and logic? And finally, what are the consequences of Christians who do not get involved in politics? What consequence does it have on the culture? And then what happens when they do get involved? We're going to talk about this using some examples from the past and even some more recent examples from those in our country today who are standing up for things that may be looked at as a political issue, but our moral issues. Okay. So let's first look at the common objections Christians give when it comes to politics in general, and even taking it as far as why Christians shouldn't vote. So let me say a few things so that we're on the same page as we begin this conversation, because people always say that you, you don't talk about two things at the Thanksgiving dinner table, religion and politics. Why do I like to discuss both? I think we should be able to discuss the, the things that matter and religion and politics matter. We have to get used to having what I call hard conversations because hard conversations are the things that spur on uh, some of the things I would say that cause growth, freedom of speech, intellectual thought, critical thinking. When people challenge you and challenge your views, you, you have to mull over what they're saying against what you think, what you believe, and see if it's something, a reason to change your mind. And I get people in my DMs who push back on some of the things that I say. And of course, they're mostly Christians. Not a lot of unbelievers or non-believers follow me. Sometimes they will, but rarely. And so it's obvious that non-believers are going to push back on my views. When it's Christians that push back on my views, who I would assume are our views align, most of them from a biblical perspective, then that's when it's like, we need to discuss it because we're both part of the body of Christ. So Christians shouldn't be afraid to have these conversations. We should welcome them. And it's not always easy, but like, even like Lindsay Meadenwald talked about on bridge building apologetics, we need to have the conversations and we shouldn't shy away from those. So think about the conflict of the apostles recorded in the Bible. I mean, Paul called out Peter because Peter wouldn't sit at the same table as the Gentiles because he didn't want to be unclean, which he wasn't under the law anymore after Christ came. And Paul called him out to his face, not in a letter. It's awkward. It's very awkward. But Peter knew Paul was right. They had disagreements and they got on the same page. They had those discussions. So we should too. Second, just because I talk about a candidate that I'm going to vote for, which I'm not talking about that today, um, doesn't mean that I love that candidate. 
And it doesn't mean that a lot of people who support can their candidates love them. Hopefully they're looking at it from a policy perspective and not a personality perspective. Cause to be honest, neither candidate like for president right now have what I would say is a, you know, an intriguing personality. My, I would say, no, they don't, but I won't ever meet them. They will never come to my house for dinner. I won't go to their house or the white house for dinner. They're not going to be my friend. They're leading my country. So I want to look at the one that has the best policies that are in line with my views, which comes from the Bible. And I don't consider myself a political person. Like I don't, I don't watch politics. I, I listen. I read a lot. I read the news every single day. I do listen to politics. I listen to what's happening, but I'm not a, I'm not a political podcaster. As you guys know, I normally don't talk politics, but I do talk policies. I talk about what the Bible says. I talk about how we as Christians should handle cultural issues from a biblical perspective and politics falls into that category. So politics are downstream from culture. Politics will not change the culture. If you're like, I want to change the world, so I'm going to run for office. Well, at a local level, that probably would make more sense because you're going to change your environment, your atmosphere, your community, you live among the people. But to think that you're going to do that as the president, even then the president's hands are tied in some ways. So if you want to change the world, the best way to do it is to be a true disciple and follower of, of Christ and change the world in your own sphere of influence. But it doesn't mean Christians can't get involved in politics, but we know that politics are downstream from the culture. Politics won't change the culture. If you think that, then you have it backwards. Jesus said that Christians are supposed to watch and pray. We're supposed to keep our eyes on the times. We're supposed to evaluate the times by the things that we see around us. We're supposed to keep our eyes open and pray for the things going on in our country and in our world. We have to pray for our leaders, but how will we know how to pray for leaders if we aren't aware of what they say, what they do, what they believe? And so to be honest, I didn't vote for either of the candidates in the primaries, I wanted Ron DeSantis because I like how he he took on Disney and the public education system in Florida and stopped them from teaching gender ideology up until the fifth grade. Now, I wish it wasn't in the public school system at all. I don't think that teachers should be talking to your kids about gender and sex in school. That's not their job. That's not what we what we go to get our teaching credential for. They don't talk to us about how to have those conversations. There's no curriculum that they're teaching us how to um, you know, to implement in our classroom for those things. Those are ideological things that teachers shouldn't be discussing. Anyways, that's, I'm, I'm happy that at least we're moving those boundaries a little bit to say, you can't teach it until fifth grade. Although I don't think it belongs there, but at least he was fighting for that. He's a pro-life uh, candidate, which all Christians must be on the side of the sanctity of human life, but he didn't get in. He's not running for president, so I, I can't vote for him even. It, he's not my governor. I don't live in Florida. But no matter if it were Ron DeSantis or who we have now, you you will always, always, always vote for the lesser of two evils when there are two people standing in front of you as long as you're voting for human beings. Romans 3 says that there are none who are righteous, not even one person, not one. So let's get that straight right now. I don't want shirts with my political candidate plastered on it. I don't wear those things. I don't wave flags for my political candidates. I have no yard signs, no bumper stickers, no mugs. Not that any of those things are wrong. If you do, that's fine. I mean, let people know who you support and why. I think the why is a big part of it. But again, I'm a Christian with my finger on the pulse of culture. And if you bury your head in the sand around politics, then I think you're being much too passive about the opportunity that you've been given to be a citizen of this great nation and have a right that many in the world don't have. So in this episode, I'm going to make a case for why Christians should vote this November. During my next solo, I'm going to talk about the policies of each candidate and compare them to what the Bible says about, you know, each of those policies. But today we're just we're, we can't even move past the why you should be out there voting because there's a lot of Christians who won't vote. They just don't. They have their reasons. And I'm going to give you some of those reasons today. And I'm going to try to refute those with biblical truth and logic. Okay. So the first excuse is, well, you really shouldn't be involved in politics as a Christian because Jesus didn't overthrow the government. 
This is also linked to something Natasha Crane has addressed in her new book. And I'm going to read you an excerpt of that in a minute. But for now, let's look at this. Jesus didn't overthrow the government. What we should ask first is, and I think it's a bad argument, obviously, that's why I brought it up, but it's pretty simple. Why? I, I would refute this argument by asking a question, is your single vote, when you walk into the ballot box in November and you pencil in who you're voting for, is that the same as overthrowing the government? I mean, think about it. Think about that. Because overthrowing the government is, is caught, it's, it's a revolt. It's a revolution. It's usually people take up arms and they get become aggressive and they go and they try to overthrow the government. So you cannot equate those two things. You cannot equate voting in an election to overthrowing the government. That that's actually a logical fallacy. It's it's a fallacy in logic because you it it's it's an equivocation fallacy in the sense of you're trying to make those two things have the same meaning and they don't. So your vote is your voice. In the election process, the vo voice of one person, a democratic process, mind you, a process in which you are a part of because you you live under a government that allows you to have a voice in the matter. During Jesus's life, death and resurrection, the first century, the Jews were under Roman rule. There was only one ruler, it was Caesar. So he was the man in charge. He was looked at as though he was a god. You had to worship Caesar. You had to pay homage to Caesar. Jesus's purpose to come to the earth was not to overthrow Roman rule, sure, but that doesn't excuse us from having a voice in our political matters of our uh, in our time in our country. Jesus's purpose was to die on a cross for our sins. The irony in Christ's death is that the Jews used Roman law to crucify him, so they used the political system against Christ. And under Jewish law, Jesus technically should have been stoned for saying he was God according to their to, according to their thinking, right? Because to them, he wasn't God. He was blasphemy. So according to their law, he should have been stoned. That's in Leviticus. But under Roman law, he was crucified because the Jews said that Jesus claimed to be greater than Caesar. Remember when the crowd said, crucify him, we have no king but Caesar. That's in John 19, 10. So while it is true that Jesus did not come to overthrow the government, that doesn't mean that your vote, vote isn't doing that. You live in a different political environment. You live under different government policies. As such, you should operate under that system and exercise your right to vote. And don't forget, Jesus said, nobody takes my life. I lay it down freely. Jesus used the Roman government as his means to fulfill his purpose of crucifixion. So in Mark 12, 14 to 17, it shows us how Jesus operated within the Roman political system. Mark says this, starting at verse 14, they came to him, this is the religious leader, said and said, teacher, we know that you are a man of integrity. We aren't swayed by other, you aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are, but you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? But Jesus knew their hypocrisy. Why are you trying to, to trap me? He said, bring me a denarius and let me look at it. They brought the coin and he asked them, whose image is this and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then Jesus said to them, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. And they were amazed at him. If Jesus only cared about the purpose of him dying on the cross, why would he have made the point to acknowledge the political leaders of the time against the supreme and, and you know, at the same time, the supreme sovereignty of God? So he did say, hey, this we're in Rome, pay your taxes to Rome, do what you're supposed to do under Roman law. Jesus did not dismiss the responsibility to pay taxes to Caesar. He didn't say, well, I'm not paying taxes because I'm God. If he would have really not wanted us to operate underneath our own rules of government, then he, he would have shown us an example of that and probably not paid taxes. Why would he have to? But he paid taxes, taxes to Caesar by giving, he didn't pay, give the excuse that he doesn't get involved in political matters. And not to mention you know, what people don't think about Christians is every time you stop at a red light, a stoplight on a, on a street corner, that light was put in by the local government, the local officials, the people that legislated for it, the stop signs, the speed limits. If you operate within those, which obviously we should obey those laws, the traffic laws, then you're operating under, under your political system already. So at what point do you stop? Because you're like, well, Jesus didn't do it because Jesus didn't drive a car 
Does that mean you can just blow through stop signs? I mean, think about it. The, those things you have to, to to look at every aspect of that of that that claim and see where it fits and if it makes sense. So, excuse number two: we will never change the culture. So, why get involved in politics? So, I want to know what people mean when they say this. Do they mean that government will never change the culture? If so, I agree. Do they mean that we are first called to make disciples? If so, I agree. We have primary responsibilities as Christians and making disciples is definitely at the top, the top of the list, right? But when we look at what Jesus said about believers, that we are the salt of the earth and the light of the world, what does that mean? Because if you say, well, we can't get involved in politics because we'll never change the culture, then every time you preach the gospel, why, why would you do it? Because who is the culture? It's the people that you would preach the gospel to. They're in the culture that you speak of. So again, that one doesn't make sense either. Because if you go out and you try to make disciples and you try to, to win people over by just preaching the gospel, but you say, well, we will never change the culture so we can't get involved in politics. You'll never change the, if you never change the culture, it won't even be by you going out and preaching the gospel. Because the culture is the place in which you live, the people that you live among. And it's most in its most basic form, we are in this world to preserve the truth. So we're here to influence all aspects of life. Politics is downstream from culture. So when you see things on the ballot, like abortion up to nine months of pregnancy, we have a greater issue in our country than politics. But but those are becoming under the umbrella of politics because people want them, them to be voted as legalized. But that also means the church isn't making disciples. If the majority of the country wants to kill the unborn, right? It's a reflection on whether or not we really are being the salt and the in the light of the world. It's a reflection of the church, the, the state of the culture and politics reveals the state of the culture because it's downstream from culture. And we see this fact bearing out in statistics that the church isn't making disciples. The church isn't impacting culture, not even through preaching the gospel because 64% of Americans claim to be Christians yet 4% have a biblical worldview. Only 4% think biblically, only 4% are actually being discipled to the biblical worldview. So we have two problems here. The first one is that Christians say we, we shouldn't take our influence into the political arena because it won't change the culture. And the second problem is that the culture is reflecting a compromising church rather than a salty one. We're not only losing the culture in the political arena, but we're losing it in every other area as well. And I don't think Jesus had any barriers in mind when he told us to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. I don't think he intended for us to refrain from taking our influence into the political sphere and say, wait, be the salt and the light everywhere except in politics. And if those who make this claim do think Jesus put barriers on our influence, we need to ask where they're getting that from. Point me in the directions of, in direction of scripture where it would back up that claim. What makes a Christian think that being the salt of the earth and the light of the world has limitations when it comes to politics? And an excuse number three, we're only here to preach the gospel. This is kind of related to what I already said, a, you know, a, a few minutes ago of, about not preaching the gospel, not discipling, but it's, it's, to me, it's on a greater scale because many Christians don't even know how to share the gospel. And George Barna's study on sharing the gospel it, it says the following, and I am linking all of these, the things that I come up with today, the evidence that I have to support my claims. I am putting that in the show notes, all the links. So you guys can go back and read the full articles in depth. But it says this by Barna, quote, a growing number of Christians don't see sharing the good news as a personal responsibility. Just 10% of Christians in 1993 who had shared about their faith agreed with the statement, converting people to Christianity is the job of the local church as opposed to the job of an individual, which was themselves. 25 years later, three in 10 Christians who have had a conversation about faith say evangelism is a local church's responsibility, which is 29%, a nearly threefold increase. This jump could be the result of many factors, including poor ecclesiology, which is believing the local church is somehow separate from the people who are a part of it, or personal and cultural barriers to sharing faith. Yet the most dramatic divergence over time is on the statement, every Christian has a responsibility to share their faith. In 1993, nine out of 10 Christians who had shared their faith agreed 
today, just two thirds say so. That's a 25 point drop. So what does that mean? It means Christians aren't sharing the gospel. So we have a catch 22 here. On one hand, we have politics, you know, that they're downstream from culture. So we know politics can't change the culture. And then on the other hand, we know we are to be the salt and the light. We're supposed to be influencing every sphere of life under the sun, because that is how you change the culture is how you influence politics. But Christians say, no, we should not speak about politics. We should just preach the gospel, but it's not happening. Christians are losing the culture and staying out of politics. The only thing that's happening is Christians are arguing with each other on whether or not we should be involved in politics. Meanwhile, those who are leading the country are implementing dangerous policies and conflict with the Christian worldview and evil advances. If you're going to say that you should just preach the gospel, fine. But tell me the last time you preached the gospel. Tell me how you're making disciples. I think sometimes people use that as an excuse to stay out of politics because politics aren't fun. You're guaranteed to be disliked. You're guaranteed to have people challenge you. You put yourself into an arena with a lot of people who have different opinions and beliefs and ideas, and it's easier to stay out of it. But that doesn't mean it's what you should do as a Christian. It just means it's easier, especially when the, the policies on the ballot are legislating morality, which is, you know, they're moral issues that are in conflict with your worldview. Is it passive to remain quiet about the politics or is it an act of choice that leads to a greater good? Is your silence leading to a greater good? Is your absence from politics leading to a greater good? You have to answer that question. And excuse number four. There is a separation between church and state, so Christians shouldn't get involved in politics. I've talked about this before, so I'm not going to go into it on great detail here, but this is not in the Constitution, as some people would be led to believe. It's been repeated so many times that people think that the church has to stay out of, of the political arena. But it was actually in a letter written by Thomas Jefferson to the Danbury Baptist, where he talked about the, quote, wall of separation between church and state. Jefferson was making the point that the government ought to stay out of the church. And that goes with the freedom of religion protected by the Constitution. That means that we can be Christians and Muslims and Buddhists and atheists and have opinions about politics. Christians have to research these things for themselves rather than repeat the nonsense that everyone does just to shut you up. Because that's the motivation behind all of these absurd claims is to get the church to stay out, to stay quiet and to not push your beliefs on me while they push their beliefs on you. That's not the issue is, are you pushing your beliefs on me or you're pushing your beliefs on me? What we should be asking is, are these beliefs true? What is true? And that's what we need to get down to. So how do we respond to these ob uh, objections? Every claim has to be supported. To say Christians shouldn't vote for any of these reasons I mentioned, or maybe others I didn't get to today, uh, they have to be supported with evidence. Even if I say Christians ought to vote, I have to support that claim with evidence as well. I'm not off the hook. Our goal as Christians should be to get to the truth so we know how we should handle topics like these in our culture. So the first thing you do is ask for the reasons. As Christians, our support should be based on biblical evidence. We all have a common source, which is the Bible. God's word should inform whether or not we should vote and how we should vote. A lot of times people are repeating what they've heard, and I've given you biblical responses to the claims that I've come across, but I also want to read you something that Natasha Crane posted a few days ago on her uh, Facebook page, and she talks about Christian engagement in the public square and the things the church has accepted in regard to being engaged in the public square. And she said that she addresses this in her new book that's coming out very soon, but I want to read her post verbatim. She said, quote, there are some strange mantras that many in the church have come to accept regarding Christian engagement in the public square. I discuss a lot of them in my upcoming book, When the Culture Hates You. One that particularly bothers me is when people say that because Jesus gave up his power on the cross, Christians should give up seeking power as well. It's a popular thing to say in some circles, but it doesn't check out. Here's how I respond in the book. This is problematic reasoning in two ways. First, it's not even an accurate characterization of the cross. Jesus willingly laid down his life. That's John 10, 18. 
While it may have looked to people like he was defeated by the cross, in reality, Jesus' atoning death and subsequent resurrection were the greatest victory of all time. As fully man and fully God, Jesus was and still is sovereign over all things. But let's say for the sake of argument that Jesus did in some vague sense give up his power by allowing himself to be crucified for mankind. Does it follow from the nature of Jesus's atoning death that Christians should not influence their governments to make and enforce laws that promote the common good? That would be a very hard case to make. Just because Jesus didn't achieve one type of good, spiritual atonement, through political processes doesn't mean that we shouldn't achieve other types of good through those processes. Of course, it it would be possible that such activists are prohibited elsewhere in the Bible, but that's not the case. It's the consistent witness of scripture that God cares about the just and righteous functioning of societies, the godly application of power by the rulers that God has sovereignly put in place. To suggest that Jesus gave up his power on the cross and therefore we should give up ours as well is to equivocate between spiritual and social senses of the term and ignore the rest of scripture. End quote. So Natasha is using logic and scripture to address the issues that Christians say that we should give up our power because Jesus did. And that's how we ought to address those who make claims using scripture, but incorrectly. This all comes down to the fact that we have to know our Bibles. We must interpret scripture in light of scripture. So ask questions and challenge these claims because if it results in passivity, it's probably not scriptural. Jesus was not passive. The way the world portrays Christ today looks as though he was passive. And when the church falls in line with that idea, we're not being influenced by the word, but we're being influenced by the world. And then we take ourselves out of situations that we were never meant to be taken out of. So what are the consequences of when Christians do and don't get involved in politics? First, let me say that what you've likely heard many, many times, so many times, in fact, that it can sound cliche is true. But regardless of how many times you've heard it, I need to say it again. Those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Christianity is not an ignorant religion. It's not passive. People say, and I agree with them, that Christians shouldn't be more concerned about politics than reading their Bibles. Okay, but what makes you think that just because a Christian knows and follows politics that they're not reading their Bibles? Your knowledge of God's word should inform every area of your life, including politics. And I'm going to touch on a few issues that we're that we you know were considered political in their time, but were really moral, because as Dr. Frank Turk says about legislating morality, all laws legislate morality. The question is, whose morality? And again, just because something is considered a political issue and the government decides on it doesn't mean it's okay in the eyes of God. Slavery was legal and considered a political issue in this country at one point, but that doesn't mean Christians should not have spoken up about it. Abortion is legal in many states in this nation and considered a political issue. That doesn't mean Christians should stay quiet about this human rights issue. In fact, I would go as far as saying that if you are staying quiet on those issues, what good reason do you have? Your responsibility as a human being, as a Christian, is to speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. It is to fight for the vulnerable. One way to do that is through voting, because we have the opportunity as Christians to vote for these things. So we still speak up. And even if we didn't, even if, even if the law said you cannot speak about these things or there'll be repercussions, well, you still have the op obligation and responsibility to speak up. Proverbs 3, 31, 8 through 9 says, speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly, defend the rights of the poor and needy. I want to read an excerpt from the BBC on the history of the, of the abolition of slavery and how Christians influenced others to see the immoral and godlessness of slavery in the U U.S. and around the world. And then again, all, all links from this podcast episode will be in the show notes. And they say this, quote, while some clergymen were using Christian scriptures to propagate slavery, others were scouring the Bible to end it. Although evangelicals tend to receive most of the credit for this, the origins of Christian abolitionism can be traced to the late 17th century and the religious society of Friends or Quakers. Since their establishment in the mid-17th century, Quakers had faced persecution for their beliefs which stated that everyone was equal in the sight of God and capable of receiving their light of God's spirit and wisdom, including Africans. 
Several of their founders, including George Fox and Benjamin Lay, encouraged fel fellow congregants to stop owning slaves. And by 1696, Quakers in Pennsylvania officially declared the opposition to the importation of enslaved Africans into North America. Quakers in Philadelphia and London debated slavery at their yearly meetings in the 1750s, and fellow Quaker Anthony Benzet's some historical account of Guinea from 1772 became required reading for abolitionists on both sides of the Atlantic. For instance, it informed John Wesley's thoughts upon slavery from 1774, which in turn influenced many British Christian abolitionists and was said to have inspired the former slave trader turned clergyman, John Newton, to break his decades of silence about his involvement in the slave trade. Many early Christian opponents of slavery came from congregations such as Congregationalists, Quakers, Presbyterians, Methodists, and Baptists, who were called nonconformists or dissenters because they disagreed with the beliefs and practices of the Church of England. These Christians were often marginalized because of this, but their countercultural stance enabled them to make connections with those who face other forms of persecution. So again, the, the links are there. And I want to make a note here that slavery in the Bible is often misrepresented by many today, and Christians need to know how to rebut it. We don't have time to go into all of it in length, but I will link an article here for a quick review and overview to, you know, and to give you a brief uh, answer about slavery in the Bible. Here's a quote from Got Questions. Slave ownership was a common practice long before the time the Mosaic law was given. So the law neither instituted slavery nor ended it. Rather, the law regulated it. And it gave instructions on how slaves should be treated, but not did not outlaw slavery altogether. And so again, the Bible talks about how to treat slaves when they were to be free, how how to um, to take care of them. And a lot of them would put themselves into that situation to be uh, pay off debts and things like that. And they didn't have, an, have enough money. So it was different than slavery that we're used to hearing about here in the United States. Also, yes, some Christians use the Bible to justify slavery, but it doesn't take away from the fact that Christians who rightly read scripture and interpret it were able to speak out against it and help end slavery. So people can say, well, it was Christians who owned a lot of slaves. Yes, but it was because of Christians that slavery ended as well. So it's just like people who say today, no, no, the Bible says you can abort babies. Look where God says it. God, God completely condones uh, ending human life. They're misrepresenting the Bible so they can kill unborn children, calling themselves Christians. So again, you have to look at scripture in its totality, let scripture inter interpret scripture. And that's our responsibility when we call ourselves a Christian. I'm going to read a pro-abortion excerpt from NOW, National Organization for Women, and what they say about the impact of Christians and the pro-life movement. You have probably heard Scott Klusendorf on my podcast. He's the president of the Life Training Institute and an excellent pro-life apologist. He anticipated the overturning of Roe v. Wade. And when I took a pro-life apologetics class, he told our class to get ready because we would be the ones informing people on the ground in our own states of what it looks like to in the life of an unborn baby and those different stages. But he anticipated it. He's an excellent pro-life apologist, and he helps train other people and Christians and churches on why we need to be prepared to have these conversations in our towns and states where the battle for the lives of the unborn is back at the front lines for all of us because it's a state it's a state battle now. So he is helping lead this fight as well, even if you don't know you know, a lot of people who are in it, if you don't know the names of the people who are training other people, know that there are Christians on the front lines of this battle. So only those who aren't paying attention were shocked at the overturning of Roe v. Wade. It's important to keep your finger on the pulse of culture. And one of the ways to do that is to watch politics because politics is downstream from culture. And not only that, we knew when President Trump put those conservative Supreme Court justices in to, um, you know, on the Supreme Court, that that was why there was a likelihood of Roe v. Wade being overturned. So here is what now says about Christians influencing the pro-life movement and the impact it's having on abortion. Quote, first, Christian morality has been a rallying cry for anti-abortion groups with prominent figures such as Jerry Falwell, Paul Weyrich, and Tim LaHaye of the moral majority, Phyllis Schlafly, 
as Schlafly advocating for traditional family values and Kristen Hawkins leading students for life's unapologetic campaign against abortion. Christian morality deeply rooted in scripture plays a pivotal role in influencing individuals, life choices and shaping perspectives on abortion. This influence extends beyond doctrinal distinctions among Christian denominations as seen in the diverse stances documented by the Pew research center, different denominations, such as the American Baptist churches, Southern Baptist convention, Catholic church, Presbyterians and Methodists exhibit varying positions on abortion, reflecting the nuanced interplay between personal beliefs, religious devotion, and official church positions. A compelling trend emerges, highlighting a cor correlation between the strength of one's beliefs in the Christian God and the depth of conviction against abortion. The more firmly individuals hold their faith, the more resolute their opposition to abortion tends to be underscoring the integral role of religious beliefs in shaping attitudes towards reproductive rights. Church attendance further strengthen anti-abortion sentiments, with higher attendance correlating with more pronounced disapproval of abortion. This suggests that regular engagement with religious practices and community reinforces individual moral convictions, emphasizing the powerful impact of communal regulate religious experiences and shaping views on abortion. Moreover, the steadfastness of Christian morality is evident in those who firmly hold anti-abortion views, particularly when their church explicitly condemns abortion based on spiritually interpreted morality. In such cases, individuals are more likely to align their beliefs with the doctrinal stance of their church, establishing a direct and influential link between religious teachings and the formation of personal convictions on abortion. This intricate web of relationships between personal faith, church teachings, and moral viewpoints underscores the multifaceted nature of Christianity's influence on abortion attitudes within congregational settings, end quote. This is not even a, it's a secular, it's a secular website. They're not Christian, but they notice the impact that Christians have. It means that Christians who take a biblical view on life have a huge impact on the pro-life movement and they feel it. They feel it. But if Christians said, well, no, we're just here to preach the gospel. That's a political issue. And they gave no voice to the cause. You wouldn't read articles like this. Ava Edel, the elderly woman arrested recently for violating the FACE Act while protesting at an abortion, abortion clinic, was also a death camp survivor from Yugoslavia. She almost died in the camp and so did her mother who helped rescue, rescue her out of it. She came to America in the fifties. And of course, at first she loved the country and she still does, but she was appalled to see that America killed her unborn. She is a Christian and pro-life activist with arrests and fines that total in the hundreds of thousands, but she fights for the unborn because she knows what it's like to be killed or oppressed be, as a human being because of who you are. And this is what she said about her why, like why she speaks up, why she becomes the target, why she risks her life and her freedom, and why she's prepared even now to die in prison, like she said, after her recent sentencing for standing up for human life, because I believe she's like 75 years old. So she says, I could die in prison. Here's her quote. Let me liken it to something Edel explained thoughtfully as we discuss her arrests around the country. She referred back to her time in Gukawa. When we were rounded up to be killed, we were placed in cattle cars and our train was headed toward the extermination, extermination camp. What if citizens of my country would have overcome their fear and a number of them stood on those railroad tracks between the gate of the entrance to the death camp and the train? The train would have had to have stopped. And while the guards on those trains would be busy rounding up the ones that were in front of the train, another group could have come in, pried open our cattle car, and possibly set us free. But nobody did. She has heard stories that people stood by the roadside and they wept as her cattle cars went by carrying them to prison. But that didn't help any of us, she said. So when we place our bodies between the woman and the clinic, we buy time to get our sidewalk counselors the opportunity to speak with the women and hopefully open their hearts with love for their babies and let their babies live, the death camp survivor said. After all, she added, we offer them everything there is, including adoptions. I've offered to adopt babies on the spot. We're standing between the killer and the victim. I could say more. There are hundreds of examples, probably thousands of Christians changing culture and society just for standing up and giving a voice to the issues that may have been considered political at the time. Some were killed. Some were thrown into prison. 
but all made a difference. Casting a vote is not the same as picketing at an abortion clinic. It is not the same as joining a march in Washington, D.C. It is not the same as posting a comment on social media. It is not the same as having converse, a conversation with a friend about transgender ideology. Casting a vote is much less scary than that. Casting a vote doesn't make your heart beat fast because you're afraid of what people might think of you in the moment. Why is that? Because when you cast your vote, you go into a booth where no one can see you. There's no threat of being made fun of. There's no threat of anybody uh, coming at you to oppose your views because you're by yourself. It's private, but it can in many ways be just as impactful as carrying a picket sign, posting a comment or having a conversation because it's that important. I used to live in California where my vote for president never went the way that I wanted it to, but I still voted. I would not use the excuse that my vote wouldn't count. There are other, other things to vote for and voting at the local level in some ways is just as, as, just as or even more important than voting for the president. And I pray Christians will let their Bibles inform how they vote because everybody lets their worldview inform how they vote. These policies are not political. That's silly. They're moral policies and they demand a vote. If you have any questions for me, you can email me at hello at and I'll catch you on the next one.